Welcome back to Module 7 and welcome back to Chapter 8. In this second and last video for Chapter 8, uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about Earth's atmosphere and making sure we all have at least some understanding of the changes that are occurring on Earth and the changes that have occurred in the past. So any discussion of Earth's atmosphere really should focus on two main properties. The first is that there's oxygen, free oxygen molecules, O2 molecules. This is really good for us to have. Oxygen is really reactive. It is able to find a lot of different molecules and have chemical reactions and no longer be free oxygen, O2 molecules. So the fact that we have it is because there is a constant source from plant and biomatter that is creating that oxygen for us. That is unique to Earth, and that's one of the things that we can look for when we eventually talk about how we're searching for life elsewhere. The other thing that we need to talk about, though, in this discussion is that we need to understand what greenhouse gases are and why the increasing amount over time that we're experiencing is bad for humans in the long run. Okay, so let's start with the first one. The Earth did not originally have oxygen in its atmosphere, not O2 molecules. It took about two or three billion years until single-celled organisms and the very first life, life forms created the oxygen that we um, kind of take for granted as we breathe. Those biomatter um, sources not only made free oxygen, but they also made ozone molecules, three different um, oxygen atoms all together in one molecule. Our ozone layer is really important to um, our ability to have life as we know it here on Earth as well, because it is a very important part of the protection that we have from the high energy forms of the sun's light. We talked back uh, in chapter five about the fact that the sun makes a black body curve of different types of light and that it makes the most visible light, but that means that it also makes a lot of ultraviolet and a lot of infrared. Infrared we think of as heat, so the light and heat from the sun is important to us. Ultraviolet, those high energy forms of light, they can be really dangerous to a lot of um, life forms, including our own. It's why we wear sunscreen and the ozone layer protects us from the even worse wavelengths than the ones that do currently make it down to Earth's uh, surface. So the way that we as human beings have altered Earth's atmosphere, can there's a lot of different things going on, but the two simplest things we can pinpoint are destroying the ozone layer through technologies that we built for ourselves and adding carbon dioxide, again, through technologies that we've built for ourselves. Now, like I said, the ozone layer protects us and it comes from biomatter that is also making our free oxygen, but that molecule, ozone, can be broken up quite easily through chemical reactions with things called chlorofluorocarbons. Complex molecules, we'll call them CFCs, that were used for a while in a lot of different human technologies. Aerosols, hairspray is the one that lots of people can pinpoint as that thing they remember had CFCs in it, but refrigeration um, uses as well. But as we recognized that cause and effect, this thing we built had this unexpected consequence, we need to stop using it. Scientific evidence was brought to governments and CFCs have been banned from most uses. The destroying of the ozone layer is not a cause of climate change. The ozone layer is slowly um, working uh, back up to what it used to be because we're not making new CFCs at the rate that we used to be. And so things are looking up and it's a really kind of simplified story, certainly, a simplified story of science policy going well when science policy is acknowledged by governments that can put into place public policy and laws. Now, the adding of carbon dioxide is an ongoing story with a very different current outcome. 
There is far more scientific evidence and research over a much broader span of time that shows that the long-term effects of carbon dioxide have been increasing in amounts and are causing warming of our atmosphere. So it is a story that we're all currently part of and one that in this lecture video I'm not going to be able to touch on all of the newest aspects of, but it's one that we really should be aware of as we exist as citizens in the world around us. Now to make sure we understand why carbon dioxide is the thing that people talk about and pinpoint, um, we do need to take a step back and make sure we understand what greenhouse gases are and what they do. So carbon dioxide is what's known as a greenhouse gas. And if we take a step back and think about a greenhouse, if you've ever gone to a greenhouse um, and you walk in and it's more humid and it's warmer and we're able in a greenhouse to grow plants and flowers that might not survive if it's in the kind of colder Michigan winter or fall or spring. <laughs> but in a greenhouse, the thing that is happening is sunlight is able to get through the glass but the infrared, the heat that would bounce off um, and be sent back through the glass, the infrared light is, is trapped and we get more warmth without it being like a big mirror effect. The light's not bouncing around, but the heat is. Clouds and just molecules themselves in our atmosphere go through a very similar process. Sunlight can get through most of those layers and they warm our surface, and then the Earth's surface gives off heat, infrared wavelengths, that don't make it through the clouds. And we basically are covering ourselves in a blanket. Now, some amount of greenhouse gases are useful to have around. If we had no atmosphere whatsoever, it would be significantly colder on Earth based on our distance from the sun and the amount of sunlight that the sun makes. So it's nice to have a blanket on a cold night. But we don't just have a small amount anymore. For four billion years before humans came along, there were lots and lots of different processes that could emit carbon um, containing molecules into the atmosphere and absorb carbon containing molecules out of the atmosphere. This slide um, contains a lot more detail than we need for our particular course, but I want us to be aware that all of these different locations, the atmosphere, the surface part of the oceans, deeper oceans, sedimentary rock, the mantle, soil, all of these things, they are places where carbon can be stored. The biggest storage of carbon is in limestone, coal, oil, natural gas, um, in things that are basically just holding it in solids. But the Industrial Revolution came along where we suddenly had technologies that needed coal and oil and natural gas. And so when we look at the flow of all of these different sources. All of the black arrows here, and again, we're not trying to memorize this picture. Uh, it is giving us a sense, though, of what humans are able to do. The black arrows are ones that are naturally occurring, and with roughly the amounts of natural occurrence. And the red arrows are specifically related to human activity. So when we burn stuff, when we burn um, fuel, for ourselves when we burn trees in um, to make fires, things like that. We're taking carbon out of the land biome and putting it up into the atmosphere. Farming processes um, get a lot of the carbon out of the soil and put it into the atmosphere. And then the really big one, all of those different technologies that we built that use coal and oil and natural gas, fossil fuels, they put carbon into the atmosphere at a rate that is much higher than other natural um, processes that do that.
in this picture, um, and this picture is a little bit older and a little bit different than our textbook. In this picture, if we compare fossil fuel burning to volcanic eruptions, it's a factor of 10. In our um, textbook, there is a note in this chapter that says that it's actually more like a factor of 100 times more through fossil fuel burning than through volcanic eruptions. What that means then for us is that we start to get more and more of these greenhouse gases, like having all of these blankets, and now we're in the middle of summer with like 16 wool blankets around us, that we wanna get rid of. And it's not that easy to get rid of the greenhouse gases as it was to put these things into the atmosphere. Earth and Venus started with roughly the same amount of carbon dioxide, but Earth was able to collect a lot of water. We'll talk about later in the module that that mostly came from comets. Earth was able to collect a lot of water to create these surface oceans that absorbed the carbon dioxide and then stored it in sediments. If all of Earth's carbon were dug back up and put into the atmosphere, we would look very similar to Venus, which has a current runaway greenhouse effect. That's what's shown here on the slide. Burning fossil fuels brings us closer and closer to that possibility, especially if there is no large-scale public policy put into place to deal with it. Instead, what we get is just this constant um, increase in carbon dioxide. So on the left, this is a picture from our textbook showing the carbon dioxide concentration, PPM means parts per million, over the last couple of decades where the Industrial Re Revolution started and we continue to use more and more technologies that require these fossil fuels. And over a longer period of time, but you can see from the 1960s onwards in the right picture, we show the um, global temperature anomaly. So what it used to be in the 1961 to 1990 average, what it used to be and what is currently happening in the last decade or so. Uh, you can also click the link in the posted slides on our Blackboard site for more data visualizations um, by Ed Hawkins. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube and don't have our slides, um, you can uh, search that name um, online. But there is a lot of resources out there to show basically the observations. And unlike the ozone layer story of the scientific evidence was brought to governments, policies were put into place, and now there's um, improvement, we're still in the middle of that story. And it is a much larger problem that we all have to address and be aware of and acknowledge. Um, and that's what I want to, that's what I want to leave us with. So in the next video, we will be going through a brief tour of the planets in our solar system and then focusing more on the other things in our solar system, comets, asteroids, meteors, uh, before moving on to our discussion of exoplanets and life in the universe. So I will see you in those other videos.